It's great to welcome to the program today Morgan Housel, who is author of the internationally best selling books, The Psychology of Money, and most recently, Same as Ever, A Guide to What Never Changes. Psychology of Money actually on my on my list of recommended uh, personal finance books at davidpackman.com slash finance. Uh, Morgan, really great to have you on. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me, David. So maybe to start with, you know, one of the things I've talked with my audience about is there is a lot of money made in the world either by convincing people that something that's really complicated is actually simple or the opposite, which is convincing people that something that's really simple is actually complicated and it applies differently in different areas. I think it's the latter when it comes to to personal finance. Can you talk a little bit about as you wrote the psychology of money and then in terms of your motivation for same as ever? What are the fundamental principles that you want to communicate to people about the way the world works that are reflected in the books? Yeah, David, so much of what I wrote about in Same as Ever was just my experience as a financial writer and, and, and also as a student of history of looking back at what happened, what people were doing with their money uh, 500 years ago, 100 years ago, and realizing it's the same thing that they're doing today. And so, look, the cast of characters changes, but it's the same movie over and over again. The way that people behave around greed and fear and risk and uncertainty, that never changes. And this is actually really important because in the financial industry, we spend so much of our time and effort trying to predict what's gonna happen next. When's the next bear market? Where's the stock market going next? When's the next recession? Our ability to do that is, is, is effectively zero. Nobody can do that with any consistency. So my point, same as ever, was if we can't predict what's gonna change, Let's focus all of our time and our effort on what we know is never going to change. The behaviors about how people think about greed, risk, fear, uncertainty that have been with us for hundreds of years. And therefore, we know they are going to be part of our future. I would argue that even the psychology of money is a book that's about much more than personal finance. But same as ever, even more overtly is about so much more than that. And it could be applied to relationships. It could be applied to technology, uh, certainly to education and, and business, et cetera. And one of the things that you talk about when you talk about greed and fear, et cetera, is this contrast where on the one hand, as we see technology develop and we see conversations that are taking place on platforms A and B, and then the conversations move to C and D. And what is the future of communication going to look like or of news or the spaces in which I operate? The thing that is unlikely to change is that greed will influence how cynical actors will try to take advantage of whatever the communication platforms are, as, as an example, et cetera. Do you as you write these ideas and think about them? Do you worry that there may at some point be such a paradigm shift that some of these principles will no longer apply? Or what's your basis for being as confident as you seem in the book that these principles will persevere? I think there's definitely uh, cycles and shifts in the extent to which they apply. I'll give you one example that you kind of hinted at. Yeah. The incentives on social media are to be loud boisterous, controversial, wave yep. your hands. That's the incentives. That's what's going to get you retweets and likes. And that's what's going to get you a bigger following. The incentives like that have always have always existed for what, regardless of what the platform was, whether it was uh, in newspapers or radio or television, it's just much more accentuated now because the volume of content and the ease of, of publishing content is so much greater. So a lot of these things where if you looked at social media, you would say this is a completely new paradigm relative to what existed even 10 or 20 years ago, but I right. think it's just an accentuation of trends that have always existed. The, the, the trend there being the power of incentives. Um, most people like really underestimate the boundaries of their morality and the boundaries of what they are willing and capable of doing given the right incentives. And I think you see that very clear in social media where you have people who, if you know them in real life, they are calm, articulate, measured people. And on social media, they're maniacs because that is what is incentivized on social media. So that's always existed. It's just much stronger now. It seems that maybe not totally universally, but close to it. A lot of the folks that are in the kind of circles in which you run. So folks like Cal Newport, Tim Ferriss and, and, and others, there's this move towards it's better to spend increasingly less time on social media. And even just in terms of consumption, we're better off with long form books, et cetera. 
Do you have a personal what, what's your personal social media usage at this point? I spend quite a bit of time on Twitter um, and not much else. Uh, my Twitter and Instagram are the only accounts that I really have. Instagram mm -hmm. is like a couple pictures of my kids. I don't have a very big following there. Most of it is Twitter. Now, I would say too that for my profession, most of what I do is selling books. And how right. you sell books is word of mouth. It's not to be a monster on Twitter and wave your arms as hard as you can. It's to write a book that hopefully people, after they buy it, will recommend it to their friends. So because of what I'm doing, which is very different than, um, you know, to use an extreme example, somebody like Mr. Beast, who is just on YouTube, just right. putting out videos, that's his platform. Whereas books, it's like the book itself is the marketing tool. So it's different. So I, I do spend quite a bit of time there. I've always had, well, not always, but for the last 10 years or so, I've had this idea that I want to read fewer blogs and more books. Mm. And I want to read more history and fewer forecasts. That's where I'd lean. So I, I definitely feel like I'm, I gain a lot of more uh, intelligence and wisdom and I become more informed when I'm reading a history book versus a blog post about a forecast. Now, it's not to say that there's not a lot of great content on blogs, but what social media and blogs incentivize is quick volume, yes. whereas what books incentivize is slow thoughtfulness. And so that's, that's, that's the game that I want to play. So I lean towards that in my content consumption. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And to my own detriment, given the space I'm in, I mean, I'm up front with my audience that if you think about like that old food pyramid and just apply it to like a, a you know, information consumption pyramid, I think myself really is the kind of triangle at the top that you want to really limit and, and say this is really al almost more entertainment. And hopefully I'm giving people some useful ideas and things to think about. But that that base really needs to be critical thinking, philosophy and epistemology. You would build on that with history and economics and, and sort of principles based. And then there's probably even a couple more intermediate things that, that I would look at news reports before before you go to commentary. And it sounds more or less like your principle is similar to that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I can't remember one newspaper article or blog post that I read in 2013 that right. stuck with me changed my life. I could rattle off a number of books that I read around that time that will stick with me forever. And I can tell sure. you what they were about, the examples in them, how they influence my thinking. And I think that's like, that's the perfect litmus test is like, what are you going to remember? A, a really good filter when you're reading is asking yourself, will I still care about this in one year or 10 years or 20 years? And definitely in books, a lot of times the answer is no, there's a lot right. of bad books or books that are not meant for you. But it's you're, you're much more likely to have a higher hit rate of saying yes in a book than in some sort of online content. Now, I write a lot of online content myself. I'm not against it whatsoever. Yep. But just in terms of the slow thoughtfulness that is required in a book, it's going to lean much towards something that you are going to remember in the future. And part of it seems in the same way that with personal finance, you think about what's my right asset allocation based on where am I in life and my risk tolerance, et cetera. You might say, based on my values, you know, I I probably spend 10 minutes a day catching up on online articles, but try to have an hour for reading of books. And it's sort of a similar idea to me, which is I'm setting myself up based on what are my values and how valuable do I think these different types of content are? I, I think it's similar to an asset allocation in a sense. Yeah, I think that's right. And you know, what is the equivalent of TikTok in asset allocation? It's like day trading penny stocks. And right. what is the equivalent of, you know, a, a, an old time tested history book? That's like an index fund kind of thing. And so, yeah, I, I, I think you're definitely right in that analogy. And I think viewing TikTok and Instagram as candy, which by the way, I love candy. I love, sure. I, I love, I love Reese's peanut butter cups, nothing, nothing <laughs> against them, but they have a place in your diet and you need to make sure that you are not getting, gaining the majority of your calories, so to speak from that kind of content. I want to talk about the principle of compounding a little bit, which I think is somewhat intuitive when it comes to finance to a lot of folks. And this is sort of the idea that uh, you start earning dividends on dividends. You start earning interest on interest that you've previously earned and, and the way in which you can accelerate um, your uh, investment returns with with financial compounding in the new book. Same as ever. You talk about this principle as it applies to relationships or health and, and work. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about that and how it applies? Yeah, I think there's compounding anywhere, like anything that gives you a slow advantage that you can stick with for a very long period of time. You're going to see some form of compounding. I'll give you like a really obscure example. I have this kind of like 
mild obsession with people who have lived in their homes for 40 years, 50 mm. years, 70 years. I, it's just astounding to me what kind of memories you must be forming in a house that you've lived in for half a century. That is a form of compounding. Another example of compounding that is like very important, but people really over uh, you know, miss it and, 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 and ignore it. One of the most important news stories in modern times of our lives has been the decrease in heart disease mortality that mm. has taken place since about the 1960s. It has saved literally tens of millions of lives. In the 1960s, if, if you had a heart attack, even if you made it to the hospital, you, you, you were dead that day. There was not that much you could do for you. And a lot of people were having heart attacks because we effectively had no blood pressure medication. That has obviously completely changed and that rate has plunged. The reason that people don't really talk about it or think about it that much is because what happened over the last 70 years was about a one and a half percent annual improvement in heart disease mortality. Now, if you compound one and a half percent per year for 70 years, the result is incredible. You right. saved tens of millions of lives. But in any given year, in any day's news, you never heard about it. You're never going to see front page of the New York Times breaking news, heart disease mortality improves by 0.2%. You're never going to see that. But over time, it utterly changes the world. And I think a lot of good news is like that. It's a slow compounding that in any given news cycle is impossible to see. Everybody ignores it. But over the course of a lifetime or half a century, right. it completely changes everything. That seems to relate also to your your thoughts and writing about incentives to some degree, because where would we hear about that sort of news? Well, we would hear about it primarily through media outlets whose incentives are really explosive headlines. And what you just mentioned doesn't align with those media incentives fundamentally. And even look, and this is not I, I'm not cynical about the media, because if you are a news producer and you have two news stories that day, number yeah. one is heart disease mortality improves by 0.2 right. percent. The other is terrorist attack, plane crash, pandemic, murder, whatever it be. Of course, you, of course, you're going to do the latter. That would be the right thing to do. If there was a horrific terrorist attack and you push that headline aside for heart disease, mortality improves by 0.2 percent, you are doing your readers a disservice. Sure. You know? So I understand why it occurs. Um, and the, the thing I'm getting at here is that most bad news tends to happen very fast. Terrorist attacks, plane crashes, mm. pandemics, assassinations, they literally happen in the blink of an eye. Most good news is the equivalent of heart disease. It's a very slow compounding over time. So over a long period of time, the good news surpasses the bad news for society as a whole. Things get better, we become richer, healthier, life expectancies improve. But in any given day, all you're hearing about predominantly is the bad news. Not because the news producers are cynical, it's because it's happening so much faster that you can't look away, even if there is a slow drumbeat of good news that's very easy to ignore. You write about the importance of having uh, low expectations as something that can contribute to success or to satisfaction. To some people, this might be counterintuitive. I do see overlaps there, though, with stoic philosophy. I see overlaps there with the psychological concept of, of like negative visualization as a as a means for reducing anxiety or increasing preparedness, etc. Can you talk a little bit about the specifics of what you mean by that? I think it's it's a it's a tragedy to think about a world in which almost everything gets better and no one appreciates it because they expected all of it. That's a mm. pretty tragic world. And I think that is actually a very common world. John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in human history. He was worth almost half a trillion dollars adjusted for inflation. Right. He never had, David, he never had Advil, penicillin, sunscreen. He didn't have electricity for most of his adult life. He never had all of these things that you and I don't even think about. That, he, that would have been considered magic to him, that you and right. I can, uh, can benefit from every day. Now, what's important is that you and I do not wake up thankful for Advil. We have just accepted it that that's a thing that we are entitled to in this world because we've come to expect it. That's just an example of something that is like a massive improvement in your life, but then your expectations rise by the same amount and you don't get any benefit from it. You're, 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 not, you're not actually thankful for it. It's always been like this, and I think it always will be. It's not something that we can particularly change. And you can imagine a world in which our grandkids are earning twice as much money as us, living longer than us, living in a safer world than us with better technology, go on down the list, and they're not any happier for it. And you can imagine that because that's the case for us when we compare ourselves to our grandparents you know, who are coming of age in the 20s and 30s. It's the same. That's been. And I think so. at the society level, there's not much we can do about it. At the individual level, 
if you go out of your way to identify the game that's played where mm. things get better, but your expectations rise by just as much, and then you're, you feel no better off for it. If you identify that game, you realize how important that going out of your way to manage your expectations with as much emphasis as you do improving your circumstances is really critical if you want to live in a world where not only are things getting better and you're getting richer, but you're actually happier for it. Yeah, I think that the distinction between at the personal and societal level is an interesting one because there's maybe fo I, I know there are people in my audience who very much disagree with the sort of Steven Pinker perspective on, listen, you're less likely than ever to die in a war. You're so unlikely to die in a, a terrorist act. The um, standard of living on average around the world has gone up so much. And yet there are still so many problems left to solve. And on a societal level, it seems that the constantly rising expectations are where innovation and continued improvement may come from. And if I hear you correctly, what you're saying is at the personal level for our subjective experiences, a different approach may be better. I think at the society level, it's just it's so ingrained in human behavior to raise your expectations with your prosperity that at the the, the broad level, it's always going to be like that. Mm. I do think, though, it, much easier said than done. But some people can at least around the margins, around the edges, influence their expectations that they have. I'll, I'll give you a personal example that I use for my own financial planning and whatnot. Yeah. Historically, the U.S. stock market after inflation has returned about 6% per year on average over a long right. period of time. When I'm thinking about my future, I just automatically assume it's going to be something like three. Now, maybe it's going to be six. Maybe it'll be eight. Maybe it'll be two, whatever. But if I automatically assume it's six, but I'm expecting or you know, if historically it's six, but I'm expecting three, I'm just going out of my way in an arbitrary way to manage my expectations. If it's six, that's a cherry on top. But the danger would be you assume it's six and it ends up as three. And then, and then look, you earn 3% real returns. That's actually not that bad. You're actually going to like gain some wealth over time, but you're devastated because of it. So just going out of your way to arbitrarily lower your expectations is I think about the best that we can do to fight back against what I described as the tragedy of everything gets better, but you're no happier for it because you expected all of it. I'm so curious at this point, particularly with how increasingly well known what you outline in the psychology of money is. Do you still get people that when they meet you, they say, what do you think will happen in the economy next year? Even though it's so even though answering that question is so obviously antithetical to the entire uh, uh, principles that that you lay out. Do people still come to you and ask you your opinion on stuff like that? Yes, all the time. And I'll tell you why <laughs> they do it. It's always yeah. been like this and always will be, which because when somebody asks you, what is the economy going to do next year? I, I think in their core, they don't actually care what the economy is going to do next year. What they want you to do is to reduce the uncertainty that they have in their head right now. Mm. And if you say, even if you give them an answer and you say, look, I think the economy is going to go up 3%, but I'm not really confident on that. Like it, yeah. it may do something different. Even if you say that, yep. you've reduced the uncertainty that they have in their head. They feel a little bit better. Uncertainty is a really unpleasant feeling, particularly when the stakes are high, like for your health or the economy or like your job prospects. It's really uncomfortable to, to say to yourself, I have no idea what's going to happen. And even mm. the slightest bit of pushing, nudging you in one direction uh, reduces that. So that's why even for people who don't believe in forecasts, of whom I am one, right. um, whenever I, I'm reading the Wall Street Journal and I see some sort of forecast, you can actually feel in real time. You're like, ooh, that's actually really pleasant to read that. It's reducing a little bit of uncertainty that I have. The new book is Same as Ever, A Guide to What Never Changes. We've been speaking with Morgan Housel, who is also the author of The Psychology of Money. Morgan, I really appreciate your time and insights today. Congratulations on the book. Thanks so much, David. Appreciate it.